unlike uh, some other groups, you know, Christian fundamentalists don't uh, generally get involved in any sort of uh, physical violence, that, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. They're militant, they're sort of a militantism, but uh, that's in terms of a promotion of doctrine, in terms of an engagement with culture. Um, you mentioned the uh, social uh, justice concerns that uh, generally characterize uh, evangelicals. Uh, there's a vote coming up, I think it's next week, on uh, euthanasia in, 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 the, in, the, in the House of Parliament. Uh, have you had any opportunity to uh, hear from evangelical uh, Canadians on the uh, topic of euthanasia? We've done some polling in, in 2007 on evangelical attitudes uh, towards euthanasia. Um, the good news is that evangelicals um, are, are probably uh, more pro-life than uh, other groups in Canada. The bad news is that we're probably um, more like our culture than we, than we would care to admit when it comes to dealing with those attitudes towards euthanasia. Hmm. What about, um, well, let me ask you this question, are evangelicals in Canada one issue voters? Like, uh, will, will they refuse to uh, vote for a party that uh, is uh, pro-choice or refuse to vote for a party that is pro-euthanasia? Or do they see beyond that one issue to the bigger picture? Evangelicals take in a, a whole bunch, of, a whole range of issues into account when they're deciding how to vote. And so um, we tend to vote like our neighbors. And so uh, out west, we'll tend to vote like Western Canadians. In Ontario, we'll tend to vote like Inter Ontarians. In Quebec, we'll follow the same pattern as Quebecers and the same out east. Um, sometimes, depending on what issues are, uh, are at the top of uh, the agenda in an election year, um, we will respond to those issues in different ways. But generally, it's, we take a whole range of issues into account in deciding how we're going to vote. Now, you've also been doing some studies on uh, churches and their, uh, the risk of losing their charitable status. Is, is that correct? Is that how you've been approaching it? Well, there, there isn't um, a, a present risk. What, what's happened is last year in, in October, the Charities Director, which uh, provides charitable status accreditation for churches, uh, floated a, a paper on the definition of what it means to advance religion. So when churches get charitable status, the government actually says you can be a charity if you advance religion, which I think is fairly incredible. Um, what the, the paper essentially tried to do is to say that advan is tried to uh, float the idea that advancing religion was church services and Bible studies. And so what that limits is the things like feeding the poor, clothing the naked, uh, all of those concerns for our neighbors. And, um, and that, that there is, is a risk. Uh, one of the things... Excuse me, if I got this right, if a church has a social justice uh, activist congregation, they run the risk of losing their charitable status? No, no, that's, that's not... That's not uh, so clarify for me. Sure. What the um, Charities Director was trying to do is, is float an idea of how they might, uh, I guess, limit the definition of what it means to promote religion. Um, and uh, now, I don't believe that they've taken any action on that. But why that's important for us is that uh, we want to be able to go to them and do re the kind of research that says, no, this is the kind of thing that churches do. We do uh, feed the hungry, we do clothe the naked, we do look after our neighbor, we do the international relief and development work. One of the ways that we can do that is every year churches fill out what is essentially their tax form and they send it to the government. But one of the things they put on that form is, is a list of these are the things that we do as a congregation. It's in their program description. And that is so important for churches to fill out carefully. Because if we're to go to the government and, and argue, no, this is part of who we are as evangelicals. We do this kind of love for our neighbor. We need to be able to speak to them in their own language and go back and say, using your own data, we can say that 60% of churches are feeding the poor. We can say that 40% of churches are clothing the naked. We can say that 80%, and I'm making up these numbers because we don't have that data yet. We can say that you know 80% of churches are doing international relief and development work. And, and then, then we can make the argument, no, this is just part of who we are. And when we're talking about what it means to advance religion, this is how Christians advance religion. Hmm. Now, you were a pastor before you took on this task. Yes, sir. Wesleyan Church in Cornwall. Um, why did you leave the pastorate? 
and, and, and take, take something like this on? Uh, this was a, a great opportunity. Uh, it uh, met with my, my, my gifting. I um, have a mathematics de degree and I have a real interest in why in, in how can we better evangelize our, our culture and this gives me an outlet to sort of answer these questions and help and strengthen the church at the same time. When you say evangelize the culture, does that mean um, force religion on people? No. What does it mean? It means to present a credible witness to how Christ has changed our lives and why the gospel is good. Uh, that's, that's what it means to, to go to, to our culture. It means uh, going out and loving our neighbor so that the gospel becomes tangible and the love of Christ is felt in people's lives and that Christ becomes someone that they want to love and to worship and to serve because they see the difference that it's made in our lives. Um, why not live and let live? Uh, enjoy your Christianity and just keep it to yourself. Because if we believe that, that our God is good and that he changes lives, we, you know, we run and tell people anytime that, you know, it's instinctive for us to run it if there's a great sale down at the store to, to run and tell somebody that here's a bargain, you can go and get it. If we've experienced something that is so transformative in our lives, to, to come into a relationship with Christ, to be free from the guilt of our sin, to be forgiven, um, and, and that is the purpose and, and the end of, of us all, then um, I think it's, it's part of the DNA of every Christian to want to share that and to proclaim uh, the goodness of Jesus Christ. Are you optimistic about the uh, future of the church in Canada? I'm optimistic because Christ has said that uh, the gates of hell will not stand against his church. I think that there's a need of, for the Canadian church to be more missional and what I mean by that is that we need to engage our culture in, in a more positive way. We need to uh, get out of our churches and to where our culture is. You know, the average Canadian only spends three minutes a day in a place of worship, but they spend close to eight hours a day in their homes. They spend more time in a grocery store than they do in a place of worship. So we need to be out where the people are, engaging them, living with them, loving them, so that we can have that kind of positive impact that will make them want to come to Christ. Last question, what motivates you? The, the love of Christ motivates me. Um, my, my experience of salvation motivates me. And I'm motivated because I want to see our church do better. Rick Keenstra is the director of the Center for Research on Canadian Evangelicalism, which is an offshoot of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. Terrific input. Thanks, Rick. 